Okay, now I want to talk about the essentiality of the church. This is a very important subject. You see, sadly, some people want to separate Jesus and the church. They say yes to Jesus, but to the church they say no. Maybe you've heard denominational preachers that have said something like, just accept Jesus as your personal Savior and then join the church of your choice. But what is wrong with that statement? Well, there's a lot wrong with that statement. You see, one cannot be in Christ without being in the church. And that's very important. In Matthew 7, 21 through 23, Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Now, I want you to think about the major premise of that, of what Jesus said. All those who do the will of the Father are those who will enter heaven. John Doe is one who does the will of the Father. Therefore, John Doe will enter heaven. Very simple, correct? Jesus also said in Matthew 7, 13 and 14, Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. There are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. So what's the major premise, assuming that someone doesn't change their ways? All those who enter through the wide gate are those who will enter destruction. Jane Doe is one who enters through the wide gate. Therefore, Jane Doe will enter destruction. Assuming again, one will not change their ways. All those who enter through the narrow gate are those who will enter life. Jane Doe is one who enters through the narrow gate. Therefore, Jane Doe will enter life. Pretty simple, right? So based on what we have read thus far, what, which ones are the correct answers? Is it everyone will be saved? Everyone will not be saved? Some will be saved? Some will not be saved? Well, of course, the answer would be some will be saved, some will not be saved. So I want you to think about this argument as we think about this very carefully. If salvation is in Christ, 2 Timothy 2 verse 10 says, Therefore I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they may also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Where is salvation found? In Christ Jesus. And if no one enters into Christ simply by believing into Christ, because we don't find that phraseology anywhere in the Bible, then it follows that no one is saved at the point of faith alone. And that's just tr the truth, friends, when you look at what we put all this together. And, and so, if sal so this is my second argument. If salvation is in Christ, which we already saw it is, and if one enters into Christ by being immersed into Christ, and we see, assuming, of course, that he follows believing, repenting, and confessing, then we know that he enters into Christ, right? So Galatians 3, 26 through 29, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Romans 6, 3 and 4 says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? So you see, friend, if salvation is in Christ, one enters of Christ may be immersed into Christ, then it follows that one is saved at the point of baptism. And we can see that we've proven from all those other scriptures that this is a true argument, a true and sound argument. Well, what about the church argument? If Jesus built the church, Matthew 16 and 18, and I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it, and the church belongs to Jesus, the church belongs to him, and which that's the truth, and the ch church is the body of Christ, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, and he put all things under his feet, even to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And there is one body, according to Ephesians 4.4, 4, there is one body, as the Bible says. And Jesus is the Savior of the body, Ephesians 5.23. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. And Jesus will save those in the one church, that is his one body, that belongs to him that, that he's built. Now, you can see in the second premise, we've proven every single one of these. And therefore, the conclusion is irresistible. These Jesus will save those in the one church. There is this one body that belongs to him that he built.
You see, when you think about what you say and what you do, is that acceptable before God? If you say the right things, but you don't do the but you do what's wrong. First John 1 6 says, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. So just to say things right, but to do things wrong, it's not acceptable. But what about, what about if we say the wrong things, but we do the right things? What about that? Well, you know, Isaiah 1, 13 through 15 talks about how Israel, they were offering the right sacrifices. I mean, but God says, I hate what you're doing because they were not living right. Verse 15, when you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you, even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. And see, in Matthew 15, verse 9, in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. So you see, you can say what's wrong, and you can, even though you may do the right things, God's not. God's not going to be pleased with it. It's not acceptable to him. But what about what you say and what you do? And both are wrong. Well, obviously, you know, John 4, 20 through 22, we know the Samaritans, they were doing what was, they were saying what was wrong, and they were also doing what was wrong. They were saying, hey, we need to worship on Mount Gerizim when that wasn't the designated place that God had said in the Old Testament. But they were also doing the wrong thing, and that they were, they were worshiping at that mountain when, Jerusalem was actually the right place um, at that time under that old covenant. So, no, that's that's not right either. What we say must be right in accordance to the will of the Lord, but also what we, what we must do must be right. 1 John 2, 4-6, through 6, He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we're in him. He who says he abides, abides in him, on himself also to walk just as he walked. So we gotta say what's right. We gotta do what is right. That's what's acceptable before God. So I like what Brother Jody Apple once said. Here's how narrow the will of God is. What God asks us to do can be done by all. And that's true. What God wants us to do, wants us to do is what's best for us. What God wants us to do is best for others. And what God wants us to do best glorifies Him. Now, continuing with this idea of the essentiality of the church, if all spiritual blessings are in Christ, in which we can read about that. Now, think about this is what we call a, the uh, square of opposition. All spiritual blessings are found in Christ. Some spiritual blessings are found in Christ. Some spiritual blessings are not found in Christ. No spiritual blessings are found in Christ. Which one fits the truth of Ephesians 1 verse 3? Well, obviously the first one, right? All spiritual blessings are found in Christ. Now, how about this one? All spiritual blessings are found outside of Christ. Some spiritual blessings are found outside of Christ. Some spiritual blessings are not found outside of Christ. No spiritual blessings are found outside of Christ. Well, obviously the last one, right? No spiritual blessings are found outside of Christ. So if all spiritual blessings are in Christ, Salvation is found in Christ, 2 Timothy 2.10, which we all already appeal to. So where salvation is found, but also all spiritual blessings are found. And then Christ is the Savior of the body, Ephesians 5.23. And that's the truth. And the body is the church, and we already pointed to that. We know that the church is the body of Christ. So therefore, we who are baptized into Christ, right, Galatians 3.26-27, you're baptized into Christ, therefore you're baptized into the one body of Christ. So we're baptized into the one body, the church, as the Bible says. So we're baptized into Christ, therefore we're baptized into his church. And then the Lord adds to his church all those who obey the gospel of Christ. It's that simple, friends, to understand. So the Lord adds to the church all those who obey the gospel. And then all people are reconciled to God by Jesus in the church. We know that to be true. And so Jew or Gentile can be added to the one body of Christ. Then one cannot be in Christ without being in the church where salvation is found. You know, that conclusion is irresistible when you go through this again if you want to. It's irresistible. 
So when we think about the ascension out of the church, I mean, think about Christ as the head. We are his body. And we would not want to sever the head from the body. Christ is the husband. This is the, the church is the wife. And how dare we separate that oneness? Christ is the shepherd of the sheep. The church is his flock. How dare we separate, separate the shepherd from the flock? And so what I'd love for you to do is, is list all the analogies and descriptions of Christ and the church that we have discussed. And in regards to these descriptions or illustrations between Christ and the church, why is it foolish to separate the two, such as a body without a head is useless? And discuss among other things what we've talked about. I really appreciate being with you today.